Hello, Snackers. This is Kareem Iskander. I'm a developer advocate with Cisco DevNet. Hey, everyone. Matt DiNapoli here. I'm one of the managers of developer advocacy with the Cisco DevNet program. Welcome to a special episode of DevNet Snack Minute. If you don't know by now, DevNet Snack Minute is your weekly 10-minute all things DevNet, giving you a quick, fun way to learn about Cisco APIs, coding, and just some cool stuff that you may want to know. And the cool thing we're going to be doing today is talking to a very special guest about trends in cloud and how they're going to affect developers moving forward in the future. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Kareem. Uh, uh, I'm Vijoy uh, Pandey. I run engineering for a new group uh, in Cisco called Emerging Tech and Incubations. Uh, the charter of the group is to build some big, bold bets for Cisco, uh, build some ventures for Cisco, and take Cisco into places which are new and exciting. And Cloud is a very, very important topic for uh, this group, and developers are a very, very important audience uh, for this group as well. So happy to be here. Well, that's really exciting. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Vijoy. So we'll begin this episode by asking you this. Um, what are the, ma the macro trends for cloud that developers should keep their eyes on? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's a pretty broad question, and I think there's a lot happening. So I'll try and condense it into uh, something that makes sense, and we can dig into any aspect as you would like. Uh, but I think uh, the evolution of cloud is happening, in my perspective, in two axes. Uh, one is the x-axis, which is geographical, and the y-axis, which is how you build apps and how you deliver apps. And both are changing rapidly. So if you think about the x-axis, we were all on-prem at some point, maybe two decades ago, and then there's this mania of cloud that hit us, and everybody said, move to the cloud and just move to the public cloud. And there was this mantra going around that cloud will offer you everything. And cloud did offer a whole bunch of benefits. There were benefits like uh, velocity, new capabilities, the new way of operational, uh, the, the new operating model, and so on and so forth. And so people started moving to the cloud. Developers started moving to the cloud. and over time, we realize that that's not the only architecture that makes sense. Uh, there's uh, issues around data governance, and there's issue around insight latency, and uh, there's issues around volume and cost. And so people started migrating back from the cloud to some on-prem. Now they're looking at edge, and even your mobile handheld devices. I mean, these things are really, really powerful, and they can do a lot of computation. So, on that x-axis, which is geographical, you're seeing some sort of an, a caching architecture emerge where a lot of data and metadata is in the public cloud and there are aspects of that data that exist on-prem, on the edge, or even on your end devices. So that's the x-axis. The y-axis is undergoing a massive change as well where you're moving from applications which were monolithic, for lack of a better word, uh, to now being composable. So you had bare metal, you had an Oracle database, which was this monolithic blob of application, uh, <laughs> all things right. intertwined with, with uh, libraries linked together. <clears throat> and now you're changing it to a composable application. By the way, bare metal to VMs, no change. You just wrapped up everything from bare metal into a VM and called it a day. And now we are moving towards decomposing that app into microservices, into serverless, so that's your y-axis, and that's going through a rapid change as well. So I think both of these are, are important to watch out for, and both of these are going to happen. And this brownfield scenario across the x and y axes is going to stay. So uh, that's an interesting uh, take on this, and I, I would tend to agree with you. Having been in the software space for uh, 15 years or so, I've seen that change from bare metal to VMs and now to containers. Um, but now that we're talking about situations that developers have to worry about um, these multi-faceted uh, environments that they deploy their applications, um, how do you actually see that this move to this multi-cloud, hybrid cloud scenario affecting the developer landscape over the next decade? Uh, you know, as far as maybe tooling is concerned or thought processes or how our uh, systems are architected, do you have some insight in that? Yeah, I think if you, if you want to look at this uh, top down, I mean, if I'm a developer and I want to get, so my sole aim is to make my business, my line of business successful. And so my sole aim is to build that application that my boss is asking me to, my customers are asking for, and push it out 
as quickly as possible, give them the features, give our customers the feature as quickly as possible. And so yeah. I'm going to be picking and choosing APIs that make my life the easiest and fastest. So okay. All right. if, if that API is available through a cloud provider or like a Google or an Amazon, or if it's available through a SaaS provider like a Salesforce or, or a Workday, I'm just going to pick those APIs or, or a Zapier, in fact, for that matter. I, I'm going to pick those APIs, plug them together, and then I do know that I need to interface with the brownfield environment that exists because that's the history that I need to interface with. So I will need to interface with maybe mainframes and maybe that Oracle database that I talked about or <laughs> are things that have existed for a while. And so yeah. my job is to move fast and pick whatever APIs that make sense and deliver my app for velocity and for ease of use. So you, we will see this movement towards higher layers of abstraction when it comes to infrastructure. So if you think about nobody, in, in fact, unless you're a geek and I'm a geek, so I would like to do it, but nobody would want to build their own uh, SunSpark station, layer on an Apache no, server. No, and no, that, and have, like, that, that world is long gone, right? So, so that layer of abstraction is going higher and higher. And so when you move towards functions and serverless and, and backend as a service, that's what you're doing. You're moving the level of abstraction higher so that the developers write business logic and they don't worry about anything infrastructure. And even in the space of containerization and Kubernetes, I mean, that's what the world is, where the world is today. There's a, still a lot of infrastructure that you need to deal with. And you are seeing this movement towards serverless and functions because that abstraction goes higher and higher. So th that's going to happen. The, the no code, low code movement is going to happen. Not everything can be solved through the no-code, low-code movement. There has to be business logic that needs to be plugged in. And I think that will happen from a serverless function perspective. Now, having said that, somebody needs to handle that infrastructure below. And so even if the developer abstraction sits at the function layer, somebody needs to provide that capability of a function, the event-driven, the, the no resource usage when, when it's not being used, the auto scale out, scale, scale back, all of those capabilities need to be provided. And that's where people like Cisco come in, that people like, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the products that we will deliver. So I think that's where the developer uh, landscape is, is, is moving towards, higher and higher abstractions. And that brings me to, to a, a question that I wanted to ask you. Um, with the infrastructure changing and evolving, how do you see that relationship between the developers, the operations, SREs, and the line of biz business evolve as well? And to add on that, what is the the you know your the cloud native, and how does it relate to modern way of developing applications for you? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, that, that that's an excellent question. I think uh, what's happened is, like I said, on the y-axis. Uh, as you're moving from monolithic to composable, uh, your application started changing. Like I said, I mean, you had this blob of an application with everything within one binary, and now you're decomposing it. You're 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 you're, you're breaking it apart, and your internet is your runtime. Your your open internet is your platform, and you have these microservices. All your library calls are pretty much being replaced by RPC calls across the wide open internet, and in this kind of a scenario, whether it's microservices or serverless, any cloud native technology, what's happening is your, your app got reconstructed as a bunch of microservices. So your operating model is now changing to something like an SRE style model where you don't have a database admin as you would have in the old days. You have admins which handle services that make up that database. So you might have SRE teams handling piece parts of that of that bigger application that uh, that allow for better velocity, better availability, and so on and so forth. Because now you can upgrade, or when things fail, only piece parts of that bigger application fail. So that operating model is changing, and your organizations are changing because now you're breaking that monolithic organizational structure into thinner and thinner components as well. So all of these things are related and the infrastructure follows. 
So the infrastructure also is breaking and becoming thinner and thinner. And you're seeing this movement towards connecting APIs and connecting service endpoints, all of these things together and building your applications that way. So that's where all of these things are getting intertwined. And there are still silos, unfortunately, within an enterprise and within an organization. And you have this velocity mismatch between the line of business developer and your IT folks and your, your modern SRE teams or your cloud platform, platform teams. And there's this friction and there's this uh, tickets and meetings and all kinds of uh, velocity problems. And it doesn't have to be that way. So the other thing that's happening is we are moving towards a declarative way of building your applications. So what, what's going to happen is you're going to define an application in a very declarative manner, and you're going to say, push this notion all the way down. So this is what my application needs. And as part of that need, you have networking and security and storage of the infrastructure that we are aware of, and a whole bunch of other things at the application layer all defined in that declarative model. And you would push it down. And when you do that, and when you approach the problem that way, then all of this friction and all of this velocity mismatch goes away. And that's, I think, the future where we're all moving towards. So where, where I, I see your, this conversation going is that you're now kind of bleeding into this notion of automation, which Kareem and I kind of live in that world with DevNet, and, um, and tying the application first and then allowing the infrastructure to, to be defined by what the application needs. And that could be the networking, security, uh, whatever, whatever the, the auspices of the application are. And so, um, you know, how, how can we take some of the uh, lessons that we teach out of DevNet about infrastructure automation and apply them to concepts as, as we move into this notion of application first world? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, if, if you think about it, I mean, we've been a big believers in intent-based networking. And if you think about what in, intent-based anything is, it's a declarative way of dealing with infrastructure. And uh, you're basically telling the system, go from graph A to graph B. And that's what you're telling the system, whether it's the network, whether it's the application, it doesn't really matter. There's a notion of a graph, the edges and nodes in the graph, we happen to look at edges and nodes in terms of switches and links, uh, but the edges and nodes can be APIs and the connection between those APIs. So the, these are the RPC calls between the APIs, and that's a graph. Uh, or it could be APIs and cost, and what's the cost of doing business between API A and API B, and that could be a graph. So it really doesn't matter what that graph looks like. It's That's the declarative definition of a system. And what you're saying is, move from graph A to graph B. And how you move from A to B, none of my, none of my business. That's yeah, what right. the software does for you, right? I mean, that's the whole notion behind intent-based intent networking and intent-based intent infrastructure. So we are taking that same principle, that same philosophy and applying it everywhere. I mean, taking it and pushing it up to the application layer and saying, what if the graph looked like APIs to APIs and connectivity between these, or maybe the reputation or the security between these APIs. And that's what the graph is. And move it from A to B and don't ask me how, just make it happen. Yeah, and, yeah. and if it doesn't that's happen, great. then roll back, roll back cleanly or tell me what, what went wrong. But it is the same notion of intent-based networking that is being applied uh, across the board. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, I think I was, I was going towards uh, the second part of uh, uh, Matt's question of, What's Cisco doing in terms of uh, this application first infrastructure? So if you think about this, uh, all of these things that I've talked about, what, what it points to is Cisco typically has been in this business of connecting and securing physical and virtual IO endpoints of whatever type, wherever they happen to be. So whether they are Wi-Fi, whether they are WAN ports, whether they're enterprise ports, whether they're data center ports, cloud ports, doesn't really matter. We are in the business of user ports or application ports, doesn't matter. We are in the business of connecting these things together at the physical layer or virtual layer and securing these things together and providing observability, in fact, over all of this. And 
with app first infrastructures, we are moving towards a world of how can we connect and secure API endpoints wherever they happen to be of whatever type they happen to be. So whether they are SaaS APIs, whether they are Brownfield Oracle database APIs, uh, whether they are cloud APIs, how can we connect these APIs at the API layer and how can I secure these layers and make sure that when people are developing their applications, when a line of business developer is building their app, they can pick and choose the APIs that they want. They can be sure that they're getting the availability that they want, the security that they want, and they're free to choose the APIs to move fast because that's what matters to them. That's awesome. Very exciting times. Thank you, Vijay, for that information. I know Kareem, uh, we have to wrap up here, but Kareem probably has one more question that he wants to ask you. We we ha we do this this thing every time we have a guest on and uh, we ask you one question uh, and it could be anything, but if you were to pick a superpower, what would that be? Wow, okay. There's so many I would like to pick. I mean, I would like to be like Superman who has like tons of superpowers, but if I had to pick <laughs> one... Yes. I would say I would pick uh, the superpower or maybe the capability that you would show that you saw in the matrix where you would just learn everything like within seconds, right? Oh, yes. Because I think there's yes. so much happening. Like I would like to learn everything in quantum computing or in, in, in cloud native because things are evolving so fast around us. It's hard to keep up. And it's not just in the in, in the tech space, but I would like to learn things in photography or or in I'm a I'm a history buff. I would like to learn things in, in history and just do it in, in a second because then I can be mildly dangerous about it as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Vijoy. Uh, everything you talked about is super interesting and exciting um, as we're coming into this new year. And uh, thank you, Snackers, for. Uh, joining us again for another episode of Snack Minute. We hope you enjoyed your uh, yummy snack this week.